When my God says let's go The sun will never shine again When God says let's go The moon will never give its light And oh, 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 the tribes of the earth will mourn And every eye
add. And these are some of the things that overwhelm my life. <clears throat> when I think of uh, and I think of uh, the composers that have composed great music around us, this one that we just sang with my, my brother-in-law uh, is, uh, I was composed by Lister. I wished I had enough time to explain the background of this song. It was composed by uh, um, Nancy Harmon, and uh, I wish I had enough time to explain the background. But I, I want to thank you, uh, my elders, and uh, uh, the leadership of the church for giving me an opportunity to preach today. Um, at least I should read a verse, and then I will explain some things from there. Uh, I wanted to read a verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, but I think that summarizes the story that is on uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. I want to read it uh, in your hearing, and then I'll explain a few things and sit down. Uh, the Holy Spirit overtakes me and uh, I forget about the time. Uh, let the Holy Spirit remind me about the time. Verse 1, First Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Called to be a witness. Verse 1. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left in them. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Uh, 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 although, although I'm out of time, but let me thank the chair, the pulpit chairman, Pastor Elia, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it would be uh, an injustice if I don't mention that. That's my brother. We traveled together long distances by buses in, uh, from Malawi to Uganda in those days. Nowadays it's easier. The roads are good and it's safer. In those days it was ever ready. Um, by soldiers, but we, we braved it, we went to Uganda and we came back, and here we are still alive. Right. Thank you for the wonderful words that you mentioned. Now, called to be a witness, David has been anointed by God, and uh, he has started his work of, of, of the reason why he was anointed, but where his destiny is, they saw. That is, that is the scenario that we have. And Saul says there is no way David can come and sit at this throne. Right. It, there is just no way. Because I, I already have my sons. And out of those sons, I have already trained Jonathan to take over from me. So there is no way David can be a king of Israel. What will I do? I will kill him. That's the easiest that I can do. Any other thing, he will come back. But the easiest is to kill and so the hunt begins. Saul the king is hunting uh, the future king, David. And David becomes a fugitive in his own land. He runs up and down, he goes into hiding in different places, and wherever he went, Saul found him. And he knew that the only way is for me to hide among the enemies. So that Saul will fear to come. 
And David went and joined the, the, the Philistines. When David joined the Philistines, he lived with them. He trained with them. He understood the, the, their way of warfare. That's the reason why when he became a king, he easily defeated the Philistines. He had already known how, what these people do, how they, they, they plan their wars, and the, uh, uh, the weapons that they were using. David knew all of those. So in chapter 30, or just before chapter 30, David uh, joins uh, the five kings that come together to fight against Israel. But the other generals come, and when they see uh, the different face, they said, this face is not supposed to be here. Who is this? At this time, David has amassed 600 men as the soldiers. So David, with his 600 men who have joined this bigger camp to fight against Israel, are turned back. You cannot fight with us, so you have to go back. And in disappointment, David and his men retreat from the from the from the wall, from the battleground, going back to Ziklag where this chief had given him as he seated with his men of 600. By the time they arrived in Ziklag after three days, the Amalekites had raided Ziklag to the ground. And all the people, wives, sons and daughters, and everything that these 600 men had, had been taken away by the Amalekites. And the men were so bitter and in bitterness and in disappointment and in anger and in despondency, they sat down and wept. And they wept until they could weep no more. Uh, we, we, we are used to say that men don't cry. Uh, where I come from, they are this, this culture where if, if, you, if your father is a chief and that chief dies, you who is going to take over from him you cannot cry. For your own father, you stand there and you look at your father in the coffin dead and you cannot cry. That's, that's where I come from. That's the country where I come from. Sometimes you wonder why people can be cruel to others. You forget that it is you who have trained them to do that to the you stand in front of you, the corpse of your own father and you cannot cry. By law. <laughs> and by the time you find a man crying, you know that the distress, that the disappointment is beyond measure. And here, not one, but 600 men sat down and cried and cried and cried until no strength was found in them. Most of the times we read these stories and we take them for granted, we jump over to other things. And then these people sat down and said, but wait, why are you crying? This man is the one who is running away from Saul. We are not running away from Saul. He is the one who is running away from Saul. Now he has recruited us to help him in his battles. In the end, we lose our wives. We lose our children. No, let us stone him. And you see, for Jews, stoning is an easy job. <laughs> but David found strength in the Lord and called for the priest. The priest, Adiatha, let's talk to God. Let's find out his will. What, what is it that God wants at this moment? And so when the effort was taken uh, to him and the, uh, the urim and the thummim, I hope you, you did your MV or AY very well that you know those urim and thummim and effort. Um, and when they inquired of the Lord, the Lord said, the Amalekites, run after them. You are going to conquer them. So they ran away, uh, they ran after them and they found them and none from his camp was killed. They fought a big battle 
against the Amalekites. They won. They brought back all their people and they recovered every plunder that had been taken away. Um, when I told uh, Johnson to read the verse, I think he, he, he read a verse that, uh, that I had not said he should read. But it's, it's still fine. What he read was also important because when you say Paul will be a witness, the word witness actually is an English word that comes from the Greek word which is translated matter. So a, a matter can be someone who dies for the sake of a certain project or a certain cause or someone who speaks on behalf of other people. That's that's the meaning, that's the basic meaning in, in the Greek language. So when uh, uh, when Jesus suffered, uh, we call him a martyr. When the apostles suffered, they are called martyrs. When uh, you suffer for a certain cause, you are called a martyr. Another word for that is a witness. Uh, just on 3rd March in our home country, they were uh, commemorating um, the 1959 and the 1915 massacre of the Malawians who died fighting for the freedom that people are now enjoying back home. And those people that died for that country are called martyrs. That's the reason why 3rd March is called Martyrs Day. But there are others that did not die and they lived to witness uh, the coming in of Kamuzu and some of them have been lived to witness the coming in of Marx Party democracy. Some of them are still alive up to date in their 90s and they are still talking how hard it was during colonial times, how hard it was for a Moravian uh, to gain that freedom that now some of them are taking it for granted and are throwing it down like football. Witness, a matter in order for one to qualify, you have to be called to be a martyr. You have to be called to be a witness. It's not for everyone. That's the reason why when time for trouble comes, people run away. Because those, those that run away are not called for that. Peter wrote a letter to the churches that were meeting in Babylon and in Cappadocia and in uh, um, Galatia, uh, his first letter. And the whole letter from chapter 1 up to chapter 5 is talking about witnesses. Let me take you there for a moment. Um, my elder Gwenda told me about the time and now he has looked at me. I don't know. Uh, I want to interpret this, this room, but I'm telling you to interpret. Uh, Madam, there, please interpret for me when he looks like that. Is he telling me it's fine or he's saying, go ahead. But look at uh, Peter. When he writes his letter to the churches that he, he mentions in the chapter 1, verse 1 of Galatia and Pontus and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, this is where his letter went. He mentions several things. In from chapter 1 itself, he says that you who are still alive, you who God has called, are a chosen generation. You are supposed to live with hope. And when you are living with that hope, you know that Jesus Christ suffered. He did not suffer in vain. He did not suffer for nothing. He suffered to secure your redemption. This is what uh, uh, Peter is writing to them. He says, therefore, since you have been called to be a witness of that which happened on the cross, be holy. Amen. Don't forget, be holy. Second thing, since you have to be holy, then get rid of these small things. Deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Such things, all these words are in the Bible. I'm not reading them from my mind. They are here in the Bible. Be like newborn babies. And in chapter 2, verse 1, crave pure spiritual milk Amen. so that by it you may grow up in, in your salvation. Amen. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
Have we not tested that the Lord is good? Amen. We have tested that the Lord is good. And we know that the Lord is good. Amen. We don't need anyone else to tell us that the Lord is good because we know that the Lord is good. Amen. In distress, He was there with us. Amen. In times of trouble, He was there with us. Amen. In times when we thought that everyone left us, He gave us strength Amen. to move on. Amen. We have tested that the Lord is good. Now that we have tested that the Lord is good, remove these things. Don't be envious of others. Amen. For what the Lord has done for them, He can also do for you. Amen. So don't be envious of them. Amen. These things go according to time. Please, <coughs> grow up. Don't remain babies. But when you are taking the milk as newborn babies, it will help you to grow up. So it is not about you drinking the milk, but it is about drinking the milk so that you grow up. As you are doing that, God is shaping you up as precious stones into his kingdom, into his building. Jesus Christ, as the master builder, he knows where to fit you. So he puts you here, he puts you there. He shapes you according to his needs in his, in his own building. And as he is shaping you like, like that, as he is doing that, you should not forget that Jesus Christ himself is the foundation. Don't make yourself a foundation. You are not a foundation, Amen. nor are you a building. You are only a stone in this huge building. Amen. Most people think that they are the church. They think that when they make decisions, no one else can change them. Amen. They think that when they have made a statement, the whole world should remain silent. Amen. But I know someone who is greater than any human being yes. who can change things. I saw him in Babylon. When the king of the Babylon thought that he is the overall, God said, you are not. I'm going to send you my own boys. Because if I come, you run away. So he sent his own boys. And when they said, no, for us here, you are going to uh, eat according to the king's food. They said, for us, no king's food. We are going to eat our own food. Just us. Just give us ten days. Now all of us know that eating vegetables for ten days does not make us more intelligent. Yeah. We know that. We, we know that vegetables or meat does not make us to be closer to God or far away from God. That is what 1 Corinthians 8 verse 8 says. But this is the test that God has put on Babylon. And Babylon tells, for after 10 days, these boys were found to be 10 times better. But these people don't still understand that this is God's work. So they still put these boys to test. After, after the graduation, these boys are given the job to do. And when they went out to do the job, they were found to be better. So that some people started playing games on them. Said, no, let us make a rule that all of us should stop bowing to any other God but to this God. And I'm talking of the Babylonian king. And God said, that is, that is now my right time. He shocked them. When uh, they were thrown into the fear and furnace, they thought these boys are going to burn. You are the witnesses of these stories. These boys were found walking around without any uh, um, ropes that they tied with them. And the king of Babylon saw the king of kings in that part. <laughs> it's not only these Hebrew boys, but it is their God who is fighting for them. One day he forgot about the story, and when he was walking in his hanging gardens, you know, uh, those are one of the seven wonders of the world. And as he was walking up there, he said, but Babylon is great. Although these Hebrew boys are playing games, but Babylon is great. Who else can do these things? And immediately, the king lost his mind. And the Bible says, for seven years, he was in the bush, eating uh, like an animal. And after the seven years, God said, I forgive you. And Nebuchadnezzar came back and praised Yahweh. Because that was the witness. Amen. The God of the Jews has become the universal God. But when his grandson, Belshazzar, made mistakes and uh, Cyrus came in, things happened there. And uh, Darius comes in as the king of the men. And they make a rule that everyone in this country, in this land, should only worship here. And Daniel was now taken and was thrown in the, in, the, in the house of lions. Now, the lions that I know who, who rush to eat a human being. 
But if these lions, they look at him, and as hungry as they were, they would not touch him. Now, this is not uh, some magic. This is God at work. Uh, when I say these things, I hope that you are going through your history and you are seeing this, is, this has also happened to us. I don't have to go to the den of lions. Nowadays, the lions are human beings. <laughs> when they sit down in those big boards and they discuss and say, like, why? Why is it that when we say uh, everyone should have a weekend on and a weekend off? How come this one is always on a weekend off? How come? Let us do something. And when they come and they are discussing, one will be found to say, but gentlemen, someone who doesn't want to work on Sunday or no one wants to work on Saturday. And this one doesn't want to work on Saturday or no one wants to work on Sunday. Let them work. This one will be working every Saturday. This one will be working every Sunday. They are solving the problems and you think that you are intelligent. It is God at work for you. Most of the times people don't understand when God is working on their behalf. And that's the reason why we turn around and we look at ourselves and say, Hey, I am intelligent. But for me, no one can play with me. It is not you. You are only a small stone in this big building of Jesus. It is Jesus who is at work in us, who is performing all these things. And since we have tested that the Lord is good, stop doing these things. That's what Peter is writing them. Sometimes people think that Peter was not intelligent. Peter knew what he was doing. From there he says, now, so now that you have come to that, please, you, are, you, you, you should know that you have a ruler. Your ruler is Jesus Christ, but you are not in heaven yet. You are still here on earth, and here on earth, you still have rulers. Submit to them. And he mentions how you can submit uh, to them. But doesn't forget his main mission. His main mission is to explain that you are witnesses. Now, what does he say? I'm still in chapter 2. Listen to what he's going to say. Verse 19. For it is commendable. First Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. Because he is conscious of God. But how is it a credit to you if you receive a beating but for doing wrong? And then you say, I'm enduring when you are the one who has done wrong. Mm. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Amen. I know people who have suffered. I know people who have lost jobs because someone just decided to speak. I saw, but did you really see? I know, for me, the way I see, the, the way I saw it, but are you serious that you saw it? Most of the times people give false um, witness. Amen. I heard a preacher talking about a pastor who lost a job because another, another group of pastors say, this man is dangerous, he is going to take our positions what should we do? They just stop him right there. So, uh, how do they do that? They go and they connive with the young girl. Please say it. Say that this pastor wanted to rape you and all those things. I've read this story. I've read it from different books. Uh, and it, it looks like it can't happen, but it has happened in life. It has happened to different people. I know people in person. These things have happened to them. Fellow pastors sitting down and making plans against the fellow pastor so that he, he is stopped from taking my position. But is this your position? I thought this is God's kingdom. I thought this is God's way. I thought when I'm in this position, I'm actually I'm doing it on behalf of God. Have you become a new God now? <laughs> if you suffer like that, James also mentioned it. Consider it joy. When you are suffering, like that. Because God has a word for such people. <laughs> Peter knew what he was saying. In chapter 3 of First, First Peter, people only thought about wives submit to husbands and the like. They don't see that uh, his main point is not to mention about wives. His main point is to say that in case you suffer in your family, either because your husband or your wife is ungodly, uh, they may be coming to church, they may be elders, they may be singing in the choir, but it's possible that they can be ungodly. 
Are you not hearing what I'm saying, you people? It's possible. It's possible that one can be a pastor but be ungodly. It's possible that one can even go to the GC and have a position there and yet be ungodly. Yeah. Haven't we seen it during sessions how people connive and they call it caucus? No, we are caucusing, we are caucusing. And out of that, tribalism comes up. Haven't we seen it that out of the caucusing, racism comes up? That uh, uh, we cannot have a black president in the SDA church. And from the time we started in uh, 1844 up to this date, there's not even one time that the, the, not even one day we said act. <laughs> Act, act as a, 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 a as a president. That's not just one day. Because we talk about racism and we think it's not in the church, but it is everywhere. And these are our leaders, but they can be ungodly. You people are not listening to what I'm saying. So in chapter 3, he's saying it's possible that your husband or your wife might be a Christian but ungodly. So when he's talking about submission, he's talking about submission in the context of suffering in that family. You see, uh, in Christianity, the, 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 Christian, the Christian doctrine of family has always said, endure. Now the word has changed. I said, ah, don't endure. Immediately you see something. Divorce. First of all, you separate and then you divorce. But in the Bible, Paul says about these things. But I know if I start quoting Paul, some people will be, uh, they, they, they are always pushed off and say, he has started about Paul again. So let me concentrate on Peter. Peter says, when the, the husband and the wife are coming together, as uh, if, when the trouble can come, when you are going into suffering in that family, live in harmony. Be sympathetic. You are the Christian of the two. The other one might be a church elder, the other one might be a pastor, the other one might be a church leader, but ungodly. You, the godly one, be sympathetic. Live in harmony. Let the harmony be on your side. If there's disharmony, let it come from the ungodly one. For you, since you are godly, let it be on your side. In harmony. Be compassionate and be humble. Do not repay evil with evil. But when evil comes, repay it with blessings. I'm reading. Repay it with blessings. Because for this, you were called. So if you were called to be married, this is what you were called. Remember I started with the statement that not everyone is called, isn't it? Yes. Now if you were called into a Christian marriage, you were called. And that call is a call to be a witness and to witness in suffering. It is by doing that, chapter 3, verse uh, um, 8 and 9, it's when you can inherit a blessing. How do I, how do I summarize what I'm saying here now? This is very hard to summarize. Not because I cannot summarize it, but because I want to speak to everyone of us who is in this building, so that when we come out of this room, we can see that the Lord called us for salvation. Let me read the last one in the Peter. I might read another verse in another book. But let me read the last one in Peter. Chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Let me read it from verse 14. I will read all the way up to verse 19. Then verse 14. First Peter chapter 4. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer, or as a thief, or as any kind of criminal. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. 
verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Why did I choose this topic? We are living in this uh, big land. We are living in this huge country. We are living in this big land of dreams, of opportunity. And we might forget about suffering. And yet, Christianity has always been about suffering. When the church stops looking at suffering, they start creating policies, they start creating doctrines, they start talking about things. But when persecution begins, Christians wake up. And when that persecution begins, Christians get ready for the kingdom of heaven. When persecution begins, then real Christians are known. Now why should Peter write about these things? Because in the first century, everyone knew that persecution does not begin at the Vatican. Persecution always begins among Christians. Persecution does not begin with standard worship. Persecution begins among ourselves. There are many people that are suffering in the church and we are silent because it is not I who is suffering. That is what persecution is. Don't wait for Pope to speak in order for you to know that time is at hand. Time is already at hand now. Because there are many that are undergoing trouble. By the time we'll be talking about we are being persecuted for Sabbath, it will be too late. The time is now. We are called to be witnesses in our families. We are called to be witnesses to our friends. We are called to be witnesses to everyone that we meet because that is our calling. I know that many people are waiting for the day that they will announce about the National Sunday Law. So immediately they will announce, then I will change my ways. <laughs> but who told you that persecution is national at all? Which verse? Which verse says that? If you read from Genesis all the way up to Revelation, persecution always is when you have chosen to be in Christ. Immediately you choose to be in Christ, persecution begins. And that's the reason why in Revelation chapter 2 you find this church called Smyrna. God comes and gives them a message. Say, I know that you are looking at yourself and you think you are poor, but actually you are rich in my name. Why is he saying like that? Because they were persecuted just like how David and his friends felt that, that day. When they arrived in Ziklag, they found they, they are everything taken by the Amalekites. They sat down and wept until no strength could be found in them. And then the Lord came and strengthened them. My story of us, we have been blinded, blinded by the devil to think that it is only persecution when it is talking about the devil worship. But actually, the authors of the book of the New Testament wanted to show that it is persecution when, whenever it is something against the Lord, when it is something against Jesus Christ. So since you are in Jesus Christ, you have been called to be his witnesses. And you witness in many different ways. Some are married with their witnesses in their family. Some are single. In your singlehood, don't say God has not called me. For Paul has mentioned that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, some of you have been born to singlehood. Wait for Jesus in your singlehood. I wish I would have enough time to talk about that. Sometimes people pressurize others for nothing. How, how come? How come you are not married? Have you now found one? But you people, do you know that people are called into these things? Do you know that people can be called into singlehood and you force them to get married? There are many times as a church that's what we do. We are waiting for the day. Which day are you talking about? Some people have been called into marriage, but others have been called into singlehood. Whichever calling that you have, 
make sure that it should be a blessing to the cause of all. Yes. Most of us, we, we have problems. I know a man who was born into, into uh, Zedibase, but you see, we are Adventists and we advocate marriage. So the pastors at a few different camps, they said, how come you are not married? How come we we'll find one for you? So they found one for him, and he married. And when he married, it didn't take two years. He was gone. <laughs> These things are a calling. You don't play with calling just like that. <laughs> It's the same thing. When you have been both married and you don't marry, you end up like you have all these other people do. They call themselves in celibate, but they rush going out with other people's wives or other people's daughters. But I thought he, they said that this one is celibate. I thought they said he's putting on that big robe to show that he's celibate. How come that we are now hearing he has one on that side, he has another one on that side? Or how come he's caught in a car at the airport and all those things? It's because they did not take care of that calling. If you have been called, you take serious that calling. Most people think that calling is only when you're a pastor. You say, ah, I'm in a Jamaica Negro because you're a pastor. God has called us into everything that we do according to Christianity. If you are married, you have been called into marriage. Take care of that marriage. Make sure that it is not you who breaks it down. If in case it breaks, let it not be you. Hebrews say that it says it as well. Hebrews says, as long as it is possible, live at peace with one another. For without it, no one shall see God. In case it comes to that breaking point, let it break. But let it not be because of the call to take care of that. If you are a student, did you know that to be a student is also a calling? Yeah. I wish we had, we had enough time to discuss this. <laughs> you find some people who have opportunity to go to school. They have money to go to school, but they don't go to school. Uh, sometimes they go, but you just after a few, a few semesters, ah, no, I think for me I don't want, you know. They have not been called. You who have been called to be a student, in that calling, stand for Jesus. That is how things have always been. It doesn't matter where you are. When God is on your side, He has given you a call. Stand on that call. You now see my order why I could not uh, summarize. <laughs> but now let me finish. My friend sang a song, uh, the press team, they, they sang a song. And in their song, they were giving us an encouragement to continue standing in the Lord. Uh, when Joanna and uh, my wife and I chose an item, we were saying, where I have come, it's not possible anymore to look back. That's what a Christian is supposed to be. You see, the very first time I boarded a plane, by the time I was boarding a plane, I had already traveled widely in the African countries, but I was always going by bus. So it would take time. Uh, I, uh, whenever I went to school in, uh, in Arusha and in Kampala, I was going by bus. I remember another trip with five days in the bus from Kampala to Songwe. And stop, five days in the bus. And when I got home, uh, one of the pastors said, but pastor, why are you suffering? Just give us the money that you are using for paying school fees, and then we can use it for evangelism. <coughs> I said, sir, it is my money. I'm using it according to my wish. And uh, that was a long time. That was in uh, 1998. And in uh, 2008, when I God called me to another job to be a lecturer, that pastor was one of the students doing a degree program. He said, but pastor, why are you here? Why, why are you using this money to pay school fees instead of taking it to pay for this? I said, Pastor, I apologize. <laughs> but when uh, we were having those troubles by bus, so it was a uh, going and coming, going and coming, and I was used to go on those roads. That's why it is easy for me to come from here 
bought a plane, go to Dar es Salaam, and from Dar es Salaam drive a car to Malawi. I've done that before. It is easy. Those are not the roads that I was used to do. But for the first time, I boarded a plane going to the UK in 2005. I left my young wife uh, of less than three years and uh, uh, Johnson less than six months. I left and my mind was, am I doing the right thing? Why did I go back? I still have my church. There has been no new assignment of the pastor. If I decide I'm going back, I'm going back straight to my church. And as I was uh, 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 thinking about all those, I got a letter from my, uh, my conference that in case you decide not to go, we have transferred you. You, you can move from Mzimba to Mzuzu, another church in Mzuzu. So my mind was divided. Should I or should I not? Should I? Should I? And as I was thinking, should I, should I not? Days were going. And I said, oh, my air ticket is here now. I have to go. So I went from Mzimba and all the way up to Mirongwe. I got to the airport and boarded a plane. My mind was, even now, I can go back. And they will still walk and meet those people. But when now they closed that bus, and then the women started pointing fingers. You know those women how they point fingers. And uh, the plane started moving slowly, going into the runway. And now the engine started driving. <laughs> your belt now, and uh, your seatbelt, and uh, all those things, and sit up right, uh, switch off the phones. And when they were saying all those things, I knew one thing, that from now, my mind is set. Even if I want to go back, I can no longer go back. I have to fly, because I'm already in the runway. That is what a Christian is supposed to be. At a certain point, you come to a point of saying, no more, this is my take. As Christian, I want to encourage you, take the side of Jesus. Uh, the world may cheat us. These church leaders may even cheat us. We hear stories of church leaders going to witch doctors in the dead positions. So please, don't speak about church leaders. I want you to think about Jesus. Because when you have Jesus, you have all it takes to live in this world and also to live in the world to come. As we move day by day, don't forget you have been called. That's the reason why our starting song was since I've been called, I must have the Lord with me. There's no way I can be called and I don't have him. This call will fail. And when this call fails, the devil wins. Therefore, I must have the Lord with me. To guide me in every footstep. I must have the Lord with me. To take me from point to point. I must have the Lord with me. To strengthen me when I'm getting weak, when I'm getting weary. I must have the Lord with me. That song is a powerful song. Most of the times we sing it when someone has been believed. But I want you to sing it when you are thinking about walking with Jesus Christ. I must have that Lord with me. So that my walk is determined not by me, but by me. That's a powerful song. And whatever God has chosen us to do, let it be that we defend that call because it is not mine, it is the call of Jesus. My time is already gone and I cannot continue from now. Except to say one word. That word is, as God was with uh, the people of old, he was with Adam, he was with Abraham, or Noah, he was with David, he was with uh, all the apostles, he will also be with you. And the only way we can maintain that relationship is by looking at our call and say, I will be a witness. You can be a witness by speaking or just by sitting. When people look at us, they will know these are sons and daughters of God. And if your call takes you to suffer, May you suffer with the courage that is found in the Lord. In case your call takes you to die, 
that you have to die for Jesus, may you take it boldly, knowing that what we have ahead is far greater than what we have now. What is it that we have ahead? Eternal life. How does we gain that eternal life? By having Jesus Christ in our hearts, so that our walk is determined by Him. Not only our walk going to work, but our walk going to work as well as our walk going to heaven. So may the Lord help us to defend that call. May the Lord help us to defend that witness. May our wives, our daughters, our sons, our husbands, our workmates, our schoolmates, our bosses say, Oh God, but here is a man or a woman of God. God bless us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.
Peace.